So, um, I'm back with another recipe from the Retro Kitchen after my uh, small C compiler implemented in Forth that I presented last year. And this time I uh, want to talk about a profiler because um, at some point I was wondering where does this small C compiler that I wrote spend its time? And um, yeah, um, the motivation. So this uh, is a C compiler on an uh, indirect threaded 16-bit um, fourth Fox fourth running on the Commodore 64 retro. And I felt it was it was slow. I mean, it was slow in the first place. It's a slow machine, but it felt unreasonably slow. And uh, what you do there usually, of course, is you optimize the hotspots. Only I didn't know what they were. I knew of a few places where I had written inefficient, inefficient code, but I wasn't really sure whether that were really the bad um, culprits. And I just didn't have a general idea where does this compiler actually spend its time. And this is something I wanted to find out. So I started to wish for a profiler that would work at, at different levels. So it could tell me something about the large scale of the program or uh, time distribution on a module or word group or even single word scale. And ideally, I would have liked this to be um, self-hosted, so working within the, uh, the retro machine. Although I admit I mostly work on, an, or actually at the moment, entirely on an emulator. So um, using the hosting Linux machine for evaluation would have been possible, but I would kind of like to, would kind of wanted to, to avoid that. I started to ask around, what, what do other people use for this? And I got some tips for how to time an individual word. So the uh, good stuff about running it in multiple uh, iterations with a timer. Uh, I got one nice tip um, where someone had was logging uh, with every next iter uh, invocation uh, all the words to standard out. So that would have been something to run a, a Linux evaluation on it afterwards, only there wasn't one. I uh, got the nice pointer that uh, if I had a, a well-written uh, C virtual machine, that could be easily instrumented. Only I didn't have one for the force that I'm running on. And uh, this is a little bit of, a, of an after the fact uh, find. I actually found one um, profiler, uh, link is here. But as far as I see this, actually gives the, the gross time, so uh, wall clock from colon to semicolon of uh, one or of several of each word. And that wouldn't again really tell you the hotspots because obviously the most um, time would be used by the top level words and uh, those wouldn't be the ones uh, I'd be interested in. Um, and I must, of course, admit that I was doing this kind of investigation somewhat in parallel with starting to think by myself, okay, how, how would I approach building such a profiler, typically on long dog walks? And so I wasn't too unhappy when I felt, okay, there is actually an opportunity or at least an excuse for building something new. And um, so this is this is what I what I was thinking about. Obviously, the thing to to hook into is the next routine. What could I do there? I could count invocations of a word. So I would find what are the most called words there. I could count the next cycles within a word. Basically, the number of of uh, IP fetches at all the addresses between a colon and a semicolon. Uh, and I could do the same uh, plus the um, sum of the, the the time slices for each for each next next cycle. That would already give me the um, uh, well an, 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 a virtual machine plus a real time uh, measure for one word. 
And I could extend that to an entire range of words, not just from one colon to a semicolon, but over a whole stretch of code. And then I thought, okay, uh, I could split my application code into n ranges, which I then started to call buckets, and could count next cycles and sum up time per bucket. And then having done that, I could take one of the buckets and split that one up in, in sub buckets and uh, rinse and repeat. And this started to feel like something that could actually work. Looking at some details, obviously the next routine should remain reasonably, reasonably fast. And I concluded from that I would have only single interval buckets. So one bucket would just have one starting and one end address. I would limit myself to eight buckets. Uh, that would result in a three compare binary search to identify a bucket. And uh, still a size that I could unloop, uh, unroll the loop for this. What about uh, time spent in the fourth core? Um, that should, I came to the conclusion, actually be accounted for under the uh, word or the bucket that actually made the core call into the into the fourth core. I'm not in the business of uh, optimizing the fourth core at the moment, but uh, improving my my application. And then I decided to have also a kind of default bucket zero, as I called it. Uh, that would collect all the um, cycles and times where uh, the VM sp uh, that the VM spent outside of uh, one of the defined buckets. Time measurement worked. Um, I used the two 16-bit timers in one of the um, I/O chips on the on the C64. You can cascade them and run them at CPU clock. So. That gave me a basically a microsecond precise 32-bit timer. Turned out to be good enough. And now we can look at a little code. So the first bit here is uh, the comparison of uh, the instruction pointer with the lower end of one of the buckets indexed by the X register. And the, the main part here, find bucket, that's essentially uh, this unrolled uh, three compare binary search. So the three compare IPs in the middle. The first compare IP in the first, um, uh, in the first line with uh, LDX uh, zero, that compares to the upper end of the fourth core. So, if the um, machine, if the VM is in the fourth core, then we keep the current bucket that we found last time. And um, then if we're in between the fourth core and the lowest uh, bucket, uh, this falls into the default bucket. And at the end, we have um, a check against the upper limit of the, of the buckets to again find uh, are we actually inside or are we between buckets? This is what the patched uh, next routine looks like. Incidentally, what you just saw were macros for speed, not, not subroutines, macros for speed and for uh, testability. And what the overall next routine does is we calculate the time from last time, we find the bucket where we're in, we increment the count of that bucket, we add the time we calculated to that bucket, uh, we prepare the next time comparison and increment a main uh, IP cycle, next cycle counter, which also turned out to be pretty useful. And uh, the first and the second last time uh, line switch off the timer while we are doing the accounting because we don't want to um, um, measure the time that we spend measuring. And then the last bit is just the, the bit of the next routine that we patched over. And the final bit here is the patch routine for the next routine. This is how I 
uh, ended up defining buckets in line in the code. So you uh, profile a bucket input, starts the definition of a bucket for the input module, then comes the include file and the uh, end bucket statement, the same for the scanner here. And at the end, we have a bucket defined, which actually contains two modules. So that's a bit larger one. Found that to be just very straightforward and easy to do this in code, especially for, for start and for the end of a bucket. And uh, with a slash prof comment in front, uh, there's a very obvious way how to have this only <clears throat> in effect when the code is instrumented. I did consider the alternative to define a bucket with uh, with tick and word, so with a, with a compile address, and found for one that the end of the bucket would be less intuitive, and I might also have some problems with headless words. Anyway, so I stayed with this inline, uh, seems to work quite well so far. This is an example of um, detail buckets for drilling down into a module, this time the, the scanner module. We have uh, two layers of two levels of additional buckets. Um, the scanner next word is for the entire next word mechanism from here down to here. And then we have two detailed buckets again for these two words and uh, another bucket for this word. I actually call this. Uh, problem here is, of course, with this way, uh, I end up the finding way more than my limit of eight buckets. So I need to limit myself uh, or somehow uh, limit myself to only eight buckets that are active at the same time. And um, came up with the idea to group these into what I call metrics. A metric is basically just a list of eight or up to eight buckets. And invoking a metric will activate these buckets. Um, and yeah, this, this, these are uh, three sample metrics. The first one is uh, basically the one that uh, gives me uh, the overview of the, of the entire uh, application. I've got some, some helper modules, I've got an input module, scanner, symbol table, parser, etc. And here <clears throat> on the right, we have two metrics which are a bit more about diving into detail uh, inside the scanner. So that's, that's how, how different metrics uh, would look like. And um, yeah, to, to give an overview of the of the design here in the middle of the talk, so to speak, um, the profiler hooks into the next routine. We have maximum eight buckets active per measurement, and one measurement could be one end-to-end -end test run uh, of an instrumented binary. 16 or 32 buckets would also be feasible, I think. I wouldn't, at least on the machine where I'm sitting, I wouldn't go beyond uh, 32. Um, I imagine also that it might become a little um, uh, less easy to, to, to um, uh, keep the overview. Um, you can define an arbitrary number of buckets in line, bundle them uh, into metrics by of, of maximum eight. These are defined in one central file as opposed to the inline definition of the of the buckets. And um, what turned out to be really useful is that uh, you can activate a metric by um, interactively invoking it, which means you can uh, do different metrics with the same compiled binary. You don't have to recompile for making a different measurement. So with that, let's take a look at the results that I, uh, <clears throat> that I achieved with that. What you see here on the left is a slightly, slightly shortened uh, for, for presentation purposes, but essentially the profiler report that I got from the first end-to-end -end run <clears throat> with my compiler and my end-to-end -end test, <clears throat> my, my uh, test suite. The first thing that we see at the at the top here, the um, uh, one billion something, that is microseconds of overall runtime. And here we see the um, or oh, clock ticks. Um, here we see the uh, clock ticks of the different measurement buckets. 
And there's two things that, that stand, uh, stood, uh, stood out here to me. The first is that the scanner was using the largest part of, uh, of time, a third more than the parser, and the parser bucket includes the code generator as well. So that felt off. And we'll look into that uh, on, the, on the next slide. But before that, the input module was also pretty high, and that thing wasn't doing much. That was really just opening, closing files, reading lines. And for that one, I fortunately didn't need to drill deeper because I could try out one thing that I was planning or had prepared anyway, which was switching off the listing of the source code while it's being compiled. And lo and behold, without listing for source code, the input time collapses and we've already saved, well, what is it? Something like 8% of the overall runtime. So that was one cheap win. And now to the, to the scanner. For that, I actually needed to drill down further. I had no idea. Well, I had some ideas, but they were wrong. Um, where that time might be spent. So we go into the next level of um, drill down metric. And here again, one thing stands out. This was completely unexpected for me. The operator scanning um, part was the main time sink. And after looking at the words, I actually understood why I had uh, put some rather wasteful loops in there. And because every, uh, every single character that wasn't an alpha uh, got subjected to this uh, operator checking word, so there was a lot of loops that went into there. Was comparatively easy to, to optimize as well. No assembler need, no, no code word needed. And uh, afterwards, the operator sc uh, scanning time uh, went down to less than 10%. And we saved another 10% of overall runtime. And then there's, there was this rest bucket which I had called rest because it was just a few words getting the next word. I didn't expect there would be much happening there. Well, the numbers say I was quite wrong. A lot of stuff was happening there, or at least a lot of time was spent there. Um, so I refined the metric a little bit. So in the refined metric, rest is indeed uh, not much anymore. Uh, and the part where the time was spent uh, was this next word bucket. You actually saw it in, on, on one of the previous slides. And I realized what happened there is, uh, so the parser scanner interface was a next word backward thing. So the parser said next word, does this match my rule? No, backward, push it back and uh, hand it out to the next guy. Um, and this was called very, very often. Idea, switch the interface between scanner parser to a this word except um, <clears throat> concept where this word is, is a very cheap word, just a two fetch, getting the current word and only when the parser matches something uh, does it uh, forward the scanner to the next token. So this saved another yeah 10% of compile time or of, of, of runtime. Well, and the last thing that I wanted to do, I was already felt getting somewhat into diminishing returns country, but um, the um, words that checked for alpha and numeric and alphanum characters, uh, they kind of called for implementing them, uh, porting them to code. And the string search, which was used well, for one, to, for, for finding keywords in the code was also somewhat bluntly implemented. So I changed that into a length indexed string search. This was again a pure fourth um, coding, uh, pure fourth uh, optimization. But that, that saved another something like seven, eight percent or so. And um, that was where then then stopped. So, <clears throat> looking at the at the overall numbers, we got from uh, over a billion 
clock cycles to 740 million, 31% time saved. And that's even, um, it, it's actually a little, little bit more. Somewhere in between, I introduced uh, one additional test into the test suite, but that uh, just cost another percent or so. And uh, translated into, into speed gain, uh, that would be 45%. So uh, almost one and a half times as fast as before for relatively moderate uh, optimizations, which probably won't surprise anyone who's ever done something like that. Uh, the key thing for me was really just to know where and without measuring, I had no clue where to go. I've collected a few links here for anyone who would like to, to take a look. It's all living in this one, this one project, the code for the profiler itself, a few samples. Um, here's where the, where the profiling is actually um, activated. Uh, two samples of instrumented code, the definition of the metrics, and um, uh, a number of these uh, profiler reports over time. So I uh, started to uh, check them in at, at intervals when uh, either after now after, after significant uh, development, just to check that I don't regress or during the optimization phase, phase after each significant uh, optimization step. Yeah, to conclude, um, the thing proved really practical and easy to use for me. I got a good overview of um, uh, where, the, where the compiler now spends its time. Um, it was easy to drill down. Might be worth to go back two slides. Um, so with this kind of distribution, that, that was something uh, of time distribution, that was something where I felt, okay, this is kind of reasonable. The biggest, the biggest user is the parser. Uh, file handling takes a good deal of time. Um, pass two, the, the linking step, uh, takes a fair amount of time, that's also fair. Uh, the scanner is allowed to uh, to use some time in this memman module. That's where uh, string search is, uh, string table search is living. So, with this overview, I got got a sense. Okay, I'm not doing anything terribly unreasonable anymore in terms of where the thing or how the how the time is uh, is spread across the the entire application, um, which is, I find a, a a really nice nice sense to get. Um, really useful to, to be able to run different metrics with the same, same compiled binary. Um, in uh, essence, uh, I have one compile run and then five, six, seven uh, different measurement runs. Um, happy with the uh, speed gain that I uh, was able to, to squeeze out. The profile itself is really just 190 lines of code. The, Concept, I think, should work with any ITC or DTC fourth. And uh, to slip in one final number that I measured in, during the last week, I think uh, the actual cost uh, for the instrumentation is less than 4x. So uh, the instrumented code with the co profiler runs or takes less than four times the time than uh, the normal production code. And with that, I would uh, like to thank for the, for the attention and open to, for any questions. Thank you very much, Philip. I would like to remind the Twitch chats that you can now ask questions, which I will relay. Please put your hands up if you're in big blue button. And I would like to start with the first question, Philip. Um, how uh, did you interpret the data? Were you really looking at numbers all the time or do you also have some graphical aids for that? No, just, just numbers, just these, just these tables. But you did have this bold number when it was smaller or bigger for you, as you had in the slides? Yes, that I made with uh, on the slides for you. Ah, okay, <laughs> good. 
Any uh, further what questions? I, what I did was I spent a little time formatting the numbers so that it's easy, easy for me to read. I um, wrote this word that uh, introduces a, a, a um, thousand dots every three, every three digits, made sure that everything was aligned, etc. So, um, ah. so the, the, the format of the, of the reports, uh, uh, a little bit crafting went into that, but I didn't do anything graphical. Any further questions? I don't see any hands risen. You can also just start talking now if you have a question. Anton, please go ahead. Uh, yes, so Chiefhoff has a coverage um, uh, analyzer written by Bernd Paisan, uh, which uh, is um, basically tells you how often which line is uh, executed. And um, the question is, uh, with your experience from a timing-based um, uh, profiler, do you think um, that just the execution counts, uh, um, how, how useful are they? Um, is that execution counts per word or per, um, per VM instruction? It's uh, in how often this piece of code is executed. And, and how, how small is piece of code? Uh, typically with straight line code within, uh, so from, from an if to the corresponding else or then or something. So yeah, after it's, every it's control. Lines, yes. It's lines or control flow changes because mm -hmm. you, the frequency doesn't change when you have a line going straight code with, without, without any control flow. But you want to see the lines uh, in the editor. And when you have multiple lines without control flow, it's, it's the same number sent, but it makes it easier to, to see what you are doing. Yeah. Do, you, do you get a, um, a different result uh, if, it, if a loop gets run once or 10 times or 50 times? Yes, of course, because that's a control flow change and the loop counter will mm -hmm. tell you how often did the loop run through, how often did the loop terminate, and even how often was the loop left by leaf. Got it. Then, intuitively, uh, I would say yes. Then, then you, can, you, you uh, should be able to get uh, performance profiles out of that. With uh, caveat, uh, that's just a, just an intuition statement. But yeah, I think so. What I did in Net to O for performance measurement is add timers, but you had to insert the, the timers in the source code. So, for example, I want to know how much time is spent in encryption and decryption, how much time is spent in the operating system calling sockets and, and, and things like that. But that was not to the detail of one word. That was higher up. So, and I had only maybe 20 different timers for, for different things and had to add these timing measurements into the source code. Mm. The the um, nice thing about this approach is uh, first you you get away with one timer uh, because um, you do it sliced by uh, mm -hmm. basically by by VM cycle. Um, uh, you you just add terribly many time slices. Um, and instead of uh, the, the the number of timers that you uh, that you mentioned, um, you sort these time slices into these buckets. Yeah, yeah. I mean buckets here. The the timers are buckets. It's just yeah, one yeah, timer, yeah. and they are using. I have twenty buckets. Yeah. And one yeah. of these buckets is everything else. So whenever I do something, I'm not interested to to benchmark. It's in the everything else bucket. Um. And as long as it's really small compared to us, to the others, I think I'm right with, with not benchmarking it. Mm. Uh, 
So, so one one thing that I could could see flying is um, so the, the the third nice thing here is is of course that you don't have to inject the uh, the, the the timers in the, the timers into the source code. But uh, on the other hand, I'm injecting these buckets into the source code, which is almost equivalent. Um, maybe something something like grouping grouping your twenty timers, your twenty buckets into uh, into a metric and um, having the, the ability to generously um, spread buckets through your through your code even though you just have 20 timers but you you spread uh, 100 yeah, you can have more if you want i just ended up with about 20. ah okay um and then then selecting okay this time i'm i'm only interested in uh, in in this subgroup of of um timers yeah yeah but i i think that's a, that's a, a a pretty pretty equivalent approach it's pretty manual because you have to insert the timers yourself in the places where you want to observe it's not so automatically yeah, could could well be that I was I was happy with this because the the, the project size is is uh, limited enough that uh, yeah. uh, this this still scaled. Yeah, I can I can see the problem there. 